that's fine. Keep it down there. Ladies and gentlemen, down with rum. Ever since the beginning of time, there's been a drink problem. Quite a problem. Even the greater problem now is so scarce. Throughout the Middle Ages, the use of liquor was universal, and drunkenness was so common, it was unnoticed. They called it the Middle Ages, because no one was able to walk home unless they were between two other fellows. I was usually the middle guy. But through the years, enlightenment came, and with it, the control of spiritus fermenti. And controlling spiritus fermenti is tougher than tying a hair ribbon on a bolt of lightning. <laughs> That's a good simile. The first instance of federal authority in this country was when George Washington put down the Whiskey Rebellion in Pennsylvania. I imagine George put down a little of the vile stuff too. <laughs> there was a fellow that really lived. What a guy, what a man. Now, before I go any further, please do not labor under the misconception that I always have been a teetotaler. No. In my younger days, I was prone to take a nip. I chortle now at the form of weakness in my otherwise strong character. But how well I remember my first encounter with a devil's brew. Devil's brew. I happened to stumble across a case of bourbon, and I went right on stumbling for several days thereafter. Now, I touch nothing stronger than buttermilk, 90 proof buttermilk. I look on my days of reverie with scorn and reproachment, and shudder when I recall going to the corner saloon, tugging at my daddy's coattails, and saying, Father, dear father, come home with me now. Bring a jug with you. However, I came from a very illustrious family. My great-grandfather was a friend of Benjamin Franklin's. In fact, my great-grandfather would have discovered electricity, but he was too poor to buy a kite. He had to go out and hire one. I have a picture of him at home, standing in front of the town tavern. He was higher than a kite, much higher. Wonderful man, grandfather. They called him the atomic bomb. Bomb, B-U-N, bomb. Now many of you are giggling and scoffing and saying that I have given up strong drink only because the stuff is so hard to get nowadays. But you are in error. My basement is loaded, as I uh, uh, was. Uh, uh, friends, my heart bleeds when I think that right at this moment, throughout our fair land, thousands of misguided souls are hitting the bottle. Yes, they are consuming rivers of highballs, lakes of cocktails, and oceans of distilled damnation. I think I'll slip on my bathing suit. Yes, liquid death and distilled damnation. That's what they are a-swilling and a-guzzling. A pickpocket I once converted told me they have a school in Chicago. Ill. Ill, short for Illinois. A perfect picking school. <coughs> <coughs> I have to go out and get one for this pool 
of mine. And the beginning rule they teach is no stimulants. They have to keep their heads clear and their fingers nimble. My friends, you set a bucket of beer in front of a peak, and you grunt and walk away. And so should you. Or would you rather be a duck? Remember, the joys of alcohol are fleeting, and the toll is terrible. Back in my rummy days, I would tremble and shake for hours upon a rising. The only exercise I ever got. A man who overindulges lives in a dream. He becomes conceited. He thinks the whole world revolves around him. And it usually does. So, friends, my advice to you is to abstain. Break all the bottles in your possession. Now, don't say you can't swear off drinking. It's easy. I've done it a thousand times. One must be careful in making resolutions, particularly New Year's resolutions. The trouble lies in the fact that most of us are inclined to put off resolutions until 11 a.m. New Year's morning. This is a bad time to think of reform. The marsh runs rampant at such times. We are liable to consign ourselves to all sorts of extravagant penances, such as hying ourselves to monasteries in Tibet, or Afghanistan, or to spending our remaining days in Azusa, Cucamonga, or Lumpak. I myself was a victim of the 11 a.m. menace several years ago. The evening preceding January the 1st, I was invited to a party by a couple who intended to get married, which they did but not to each other. I awoke New Year's Day to find a full-grown goat in bed beside me. <laughs> Worse than that, my head felt as though a manhole cover were resting on it. Imagine my surprise when I reached up and found out there was a manhole cover resting on my head. Right then and there, I swore that I would never again poison my system with maraschino cherries. Two weeks later, I slipped and had another. But you must believe me when I say I thought it was a seedless grape. I washed it down with some snake bite remedy, which I always keep handy. Only, however, after first being bitten by a snake, which I also keep handy. Those who overindulge in strong drink always have serpents handy. In fact, some hapless souls are burdened with them as constant companions. In my time, I can remember the company of many assorted reptiles in addition to pink elephants with lavender dots, a blank blue ostrich with a mixed master for a tail, and a short bruised octopus that taught me to samba, or samba as you say over a home. A thief broke into my house one night and stole my octopus. He cut his tentacles off and used them for non-skid automobile tires. A cruel thing to do. I wish I had a thought of it. In closing, I would like to offer my favorite recipe to take the place of intoxicants. It's real thirst quencher. It's called the raspberry freeze. Known in England 
as the raspberry freeze. Take one cup of pineapple juice, two cups of raspberry juice, raspberry juice, my you. If you're in Europe, one cup of black tea, three cups of water, and two egg whites. Freeze until half stiff. Well, when you're half stiff, everything is all right. I thank you.